I, well, I'm Kelly Moran, and welcome to the last session of today's meeting, We're All That Stands Between You and Beer at Jupiter Across the Street. But we have some really exciting stories to tell, and um, we're um, running a little short in time, so we're going to ask you to hold your questions until the end of the session, and then when we're done with the session, um, I need to ask that everybody exit quickly, um, and you'll probably want to move across the street um, to Jupiter. You can go straight across the street if you like to jaywalk. If you prefer crosswalks, go to the end. <laughs> so, and the meeting, the Jupiter event will start in the courtyard, and when it cools off, they'll go to the upstairs inside. So I'm supposed to tell you that. I'm also supposed to tell you that a survey will be coming your way um, after the meeting, probably an email tonight or tomorrow morning. And SFP, I strongly request that you please fill it out because it will help them with future meetings. So um, I just want to say one thing about the Emerging Contaminants Program at SFEI. It's an honor to be um, one of the science advisors for it. Um, but this program is one of the most amazing things that I ever get to see or work with or touch. Uh, the RMP's Emerging Contaminants Program is internationally famous, and that is not an overstatement. It is one of the leading programs in the world uh, because of um, the scientists that are in it, um, because of the continued support of the RMP, um, and because of the way it's designed to really always be looking forward. You know, what chemicals are out there that are being used in ways that get them into the water? Which ones have potential to be environmentally important? The support of this community to get out there and ask questions about those chemicals. And because of a great program with you behind it, they've been able to leverage resources from partners all over. I mean, it's amazing to me how much other funds and other partnerships come to take small contributions from the RMP into really important studies. So we're only going to hear three stories from that program today, but there's a lot more stories out there. So I certainly encourage you all to read the quick summaries that are in the um, estuary update that everybody should have gotten today, and to keep an eye on this program, because there, there's a lot for the future here for, for policy-relevant science. So um, I'm going to quickly introduce our three speakers who are going to tell us three exciting stories that are immediately policy-relevant science. The first one. Um, will be from Dr. Diana Lynn, and she's going to be talking to us about a study of pharmaceuticals and wastewater. Um, Dr. Lynn has, is an, has an engineering degree from Caltech and a PhD um, from Stanford University, also an engineering degree, but lots of science in these two engineers you're hearing from today. Isla Shimabuku um, is uh, also got an engineering degree from UC Berkeley, and Dr. Rebecca Sutton is our chemist. Um, she's got a PhD in environmental chemistry from UC Berkeley. And uh, you'll be hearing about pharmaceuticals and wastewater from Dr. Lynn, bisphenols from Isla, and Dr. Sutton's going to talk about flame retardants in the Bay and I think throw in a few other key messages to wrap us up for the day. So thank you for staying and for your attention. And let's start with Dr. Lynn. I went to both Stanford and Cal. <laughs> Within a risk here framework, and we do this by comparing day levels. So, for example, in our low pH category, our compost package, there are day levels that are lower than in the moderate concern category, which day levels are above the and high concern are the contaminants. Is that better? No? Well, yeah. Better now? Okay. Or should I use this? Okay. Um, 
in a high concern category are bay levels when greater than observed effects. Um, and there's a growing number of cases where there's and so we have these contaminants in our possible concern category. We have a number of contaminants uh, within this risk here framework. Currently, pharmaceuticals are in And our goal in the RMP is to vigilantly monitor these contaminants to minimize and manage any impact to the bay. And later, Isla and Becky will be talking more about recent um, evaluation of bisphenols and alternative flame retardants. So back to pharmaceuticals. Wastewater is an important pathway for pharmaceuticals. This can be just from normal ingestion of, um, of drugs and excretions, or from improper disposal of unused drugs that are flushed. Uh, pharmaceuticals can be transported via wastewater through wastewater treatment. And even at low concentrations, there can be potential impacts because these compounds are designed to be biologically potent. For example, uh, antibiotics can affect uh, algae growth, and the spread of antibiotics can the rise of antibiotic bacteria, uh, which is a global public health. The RMP has been monitoring from 2006, starting with Lower South Bay. Starting from oh, this much better. Okay, starting from, I'll stay right here. <laughs> starting from a Lower South Bay study, um, and then an independent study by San Jose, and then a baywide study um, of five near shore locations. From these results, uh, several pharmaceuticals were detected in the bay um, in all of these samples. And when compared to the available ecotoxicity threshold, concentrations were low. And that's why they're currently in the low concern category. However, uh, we know that the concern is likely to increase uh, because the Bay Area population is projected to rise dramatically as well as to age, which is expected to uh, lead to increased pharmaceutical loads and uh, charges into the Bay. Also, we have um, new analytical techniques that allow us to detect more compounds at lower detection levels. And new toxicity studies also um, may change the toxicity thresholds that we're comparing to. So with these uh, concerns in mind, uh, the Seven Bay Air Wastewater Treatment Plants led the field study to collect samples at their facilities. Uh, samples were either collected as 24-hour composites or grab samples. And the samples were analyzed by the analytical lab, SGS Axis, and Bakwell led the coordinated uh, contracting with the lab. This data set was analyzed for a target set of 104 pharmaceutical compounds. Um, and this data set was contributed to the RMP, and the first step in the study was to first uh, review all of this data uh, using standard RMP QATC review criteria. So for the rest of my presentation, I'm going to uh, walk through our evaluation of this data set, starting with the influent and effluent data, and then how we evaluated risk based on potential base surface water concentrations and our recommendations for next steps for pharmaceuticals. So starting with influent data, um, influent loads were similar between plants, and the concentration range in the influent data uh, was within an order of magnitude for each of the pharmaceutical compounds that were detected. So in this example, um, I'm showing metformin concentrations in influent samples, and uh, I have the samples uh, that are from the same facility grouped together. And as you can see, there's uh, variations between plants and within plants, but the range in minimum to maximum concentrations is within a factor of three in this case. The top drugs in influent were metformin, caffeine, which hopefully you guys got enough of before my presentation, and uh, over-the-counter painkillers. And interestingly, uh, the loads for all of these uh, were similar in terms of the per capita load on the order of 20 milligrams per capita per day. Next, effluent. Um, effluent loads were also similar between plants, and the concentration ranges for most of the pharmaceuticals was within an order of magnitude. 
So here I have an example of the range of uh, concentrations in effluent samples for carbamazepine, which is an anticonvulsant used to treat epilepsy and seizure. And in this case, the range is about uh, within a, a factor of two. But there were some exceptions. In this example, um, the metformin concentration range um, in effluent ranged between 300 to nearly 100,000 nanograms per liter. The top compounds in effluent were metformin, valsartan, a high blood pressure drug, two diuretics, and sulfamethoxazole, an antibiotic. When we compare uh, effluent concentrations to influent concentrations, the removal efficiency varied bet uh, greatly between what pharmaceutical we're looking at as well as the plant. So in this graph, I am showing uh, median concentrations of influent and effluent data. And the error bars represent uh, the minimum and maximum uh, range in concentrations in the sample. And in both of these two cases, for caffeine and acetaminophen, um, these were removed um, were removed with high efficiency or greater than 80% removal. And note the log scale, which means that a, a change in one step is a change in a factor of 10. And uh, in both of these, the median concentration in the effluent was at the was non-detect, and so I have them shown at the detection level. Other compounds were less efficiently removed. Here are examples of two compounds where the effluent concentration was very similar with the influent concentration, and so not so efficiently removed or low removal efficiency. And most compounds fell in between this range. So effluent discharge into the, to the bay will be significantly diluted. And so what we want to do to evaluate risk is to compare bay water concentrations with ecotoxicity thresholds. And so we first did a literature review for the lowest published available uh, ecotoxicity threshold, which in most cases is the predicted no effect concentration. And from this data set, since we don't have any bay data, um, we screen for potential bay water concentrations based on either previous monitoring studies or a model concentration based on predicted dilution of effluent discharged into the bay. And to prioritize contaminants, we calculated the ratio of the potential bay water concentration divided by the uh, ecotoxicity threshold. And our prioritization criteria for compounds that should be evaluated further are if this calculated ratio was greater than a factor of 1 over 10, because there's the potential for concentrations in the bay to exceed these ecotoxicity thresholds. So for the modeling, I borrowed the um, modeling tools uh, developed by our modeling team to uh, estimate dilution of effluent that is discharged into the bay. So in this case, the model is conservative, meaning that uh, predicted levels are probably on the high range because it only incorporates dilution of effluent and doesn't include um, other removal mechanisms such as degradation or transformation or sorption to sediment. So using the prioritization, this prioritization criteria, we narrowed the list of compounds that should be prioritized down to 17 from the original list of over 100. Um, and these are prioritized because there's a potential for bay levels to exceed the ecotoxicity threshold. These 17 compounds include a list of antibiotics, antidepressants, anticonvulsants, painkillers, antihistamine, antidiabetic, high blood pressure drugs. I'll let you find your favorite drug up there. <laughs> um, and next, I'm just going to walk through our evaluation of carithromycin as a illustration of how we did uh, our methodology for doing the evaluation. And I'm choosing clarithromycin because the um, calculated risk was the highest for this compound. Clarithromycin is an antibiotic used to treat various infections of the lung, ears, sinuses, and skin. This is a unique case where a marine species was actually tested in the toxicity study, um, and the sensitive species was, marine, was a marine diatom. And in this case, the predicted no effect concentration for marine life was much lower than the freshwater. And this is a really low uh, predicted no effect concentration, which is why the calculated risk was um, highest for this compound. Uh, this compound was detected in all of the effluent samples, and the median effluent concentration was 155 nanograms per liter. So if we model all effluent discharges into the bay to be at this median concentration, 
the predicted concentrations in the Bray uh, range between 0.6 to 10 nanograms per liter. And uh, this range overlaps with uh, previous monitoring data. And since these concentrations um, expected in the Bay are greater than the predicted no effect concentration, this is one of the 17 compounds that was prioritized for further evaluation. So our next step for this is to recommend uh, this sh short list of pharmaceuticals for further evaluation at next year's Emerging Contaminants Workgroup meeting. Um, and we recommend following up on these compounds to be a priority. A recent important legislative action on this topic is SB 212 was just signed into California law recently. This is a bill that was authored by State Senator Hannah Beth Jackson, which mandates a statewide producer-funded household drug and sharp uh, take-back program. And having a statewide drug take-back program will provide the infrastructure and support to uh, promote safe disposal of drugs. And help spread the word about improper disposal and remind the public to don't rush to flush unused drugs and prevent unnecessary contamination. This study is currently in the form of a draft report that is out for review. Um, if you haven't received the report and would like to review, please contact me and we plan on finalizing the report at the end of the month. Thanks. Thank you, and thank Dr. Lynn for dealing with it. There's, what you all don't know here is if you're standing here at the podium, the eyes, the lights are shining right in your eyes, and it's like the most uncomfortable place ever. So I really appreciate her doing that. So I'm going to ask you to hold your questions until the end, and we're going to move on with our next speaker, um, Isla Shimabuku, and she's going to tell a story about bisphenol. Everyone hear me? Is my mic on? Um, hi, everyone. Thank you, Kelly. My name is Ayla Shinobuku. I'll be speaking with you today about our brand new bisphenol project. Um, so most of you have heard of bisphenol A or BPA shown in the upper left-hand corner. Um, when I say bisphenols, I'm going to be referring to these 16 compounds. The other 15 compounds besides bisphenol A or BPA, I will be referring to as replacements. Um, the first thing I want to tell you about is how bisphenols are applied um, in a very wide array of products. Um, you are probably thinking, but Isla, aren't they only used as plasticizers in our polycarbonate plastics? You would be wrong. Um, <laughs> they're in our papers, they're in our receipts, in um, our toilet paper, they're in our electronics, they're used in manufacturing of cars, they are in our food. Um, packaging materials, they're in epoxy linings and cans, they're in our potable water pipes, our plastic water bottles, they're in our medical devices, they're in our oral prosthetics, tissue replacement, um, they're in our personal care products, and toothpaste, lotions, um, they're in our textiles and clothing, they're in our baby products, they're in diapers, they're in toys, um, they're coating our floors and our furniture, they're in varnishes and lacquers. Um, you may be wondering why are they in pretty much everything we could find in the target. Um, <laughs> they are non-reactive, um, they're non-corrosive, they're clear, they're tough, they're stable enough at ambient conditions. Um, they can be used as flame retardants, they can be used um, as thermal reactants. Um, so they're a very popular choice in this wide array of products. Um, BPA, in addition to being the most well-known, is also produced at the highest volume, produced at 7.7 .7 million metric, metric tons in 2015. Um, it's one of the, globally one of the highest produced chemicals um, and is also expected to increase at about 7% per year. Um, and so I'm sure most of you have also heard of the baby ban, uh, the baby bottle ban that happened for BPA in 2012. Um, public awareness rose and concern about its toxicity rose, and so um, manufacturers started using uh, the replacement of the other 15 bisphenols to replace BPA in products. Um, so now, you know, we have these disclaimers that say BPA-free on our products, and we just have the other 15 bisphenols that have snuck into its place. And the problem with that is they're so similar in, in their structure, we can expect that they would um, have similar toxic effects and have observed 
um, similar toxic effects, which I'll get a little more into. Um, we know they're everywhere. We've seen them increase in our global matrices, our sediment, our tissues, our biota. Um, we also know that we're exposed to them. BPA is detected in 93% of human urine samples um, and is increasing as are replacements. And spoiler alert, we found BPA and BPS here in our bay water, so I'll be spending most of my talk on down. So BPA toxicity, um, why was it banned in baby bottles? This suite of toxic effects, um, and the list really does go on. It's been linked to prostate and breast cancer. It's been linked to diabetes, to miscarriages. Um, really harmful stuff, and um, it's perhaps most known for its um, ability to disrupt the endocrine system. So to demonstrate this, I also want to mention that it's on the top 65 list for female um, reproductive toxicity. Um, so BPA, um, so here is a receptor, an, a um, hormone receptor for our endocrine system. And for our endocrine system to function properly, we need our naturally occurring, uh, occurring hormones like testosterone to be able to um, latch onto and activate our hormone receptors. Um, unfortunately, here comes BPA swooping in from the left um, and acts as an antagonist and bonds to the receptor and essentially uh, bumps testosterone out of the way. Um, to demonstrate further, you can think of BPA as this hockey player in white um, or BPA Elaine giving testosterone testosterone, Jerry, a good job, or this poor testosterone paddleboarder trying to get over the wave to the receptor, get knocked out of the way by BPA. Um, so in summary, BPA not good for your endocrine system. Um, so we, we know BPA is toxic. Um, the problem with, with the threshold is we have these two here that I show. The first one, 150 nanograms per liter, was used by the European Union. Um, and it's been accused of not being as sensitive as it should be because they omitted the most uh, sensitive species in their analysis. So we, um, uh, so Maxine Wright Walters in 2010 did a weight of evidence approach where she tabulated 60 different toxicity studies for bisphenol looking at 24 different marine and freshwater organisms derive this more sensitive 60 nanogram per liter PNAC, which is what uh, we'll be using to compare our levels to. So BPA replacement toxicity, as I mentioned, they're very similar in structure. Um, one study that reviewed 14 BPA replacement toxicity studies um, determined BPA replacement to indeed have similar effects, that same suite that I showed on the BPA slide and at comparable potencies, so there's not enough data to really confidently um, say whether or not to higher or lower. Um, so knowing that BPS is the other bisphenol that we see in our base samples, does anyone have any guesses for whether or not it would be more or less toxic than BPA? Um, so the PNEC for BPA is 60 nanograms per liter. Lower would be more toxic. That amount, any guesses? Lower, we think it's lower, we think it's more toxic. Fortunately, we don't know. <laughs> Hot twist. <laughs> um, so yeah, we're not sure. And um, this is you know, a cause for concern. That means this high production volume chemical that we see in our bay waters, we don't have a um, ecotoxicity threshold to be able to compare it to and adequately assess our risk to those compounds. So in summary, we have a PNAC for BPA, or a few. We're not really very confident on which one we should use. We don't have a PNAC for BPS or any of the other 14 uh, bisphenols. And we also don't know what their combined effects are. So we don't know when they're all present in a mixture together um, or when more than one of them is what their, what their toxic effects are. And so what is uh, the RMP's stake in this? Our emerging contaminant experts have been itching to answer our main emerging contaminant um, management question with regards to bisphenols for years. Um, in 2010, we had a larger pharmaceutical scan, and um, BPA was added into this scan. Unfortunately, our detection limits were so high that we couldn't confidently say uh, that BPA wasn't in our water. 
and um, the other 15 bisphenols weren't included in this scan either. Um, so currently, bisphenols sit here in the lower tier, and these are the same tiers that Diana has just uh, shown. And they're here because, again, um, we, we don't have the best information on how toxic they are, and we were um, unaware of whether or not they were in our bay waters. Um, and all of the compounds here in the lower possible concern category, we're looking for ways to gather more information and move them out and up to any of these um, other categories. And so our emerging contaminant experts were really excited when our collaborators, Da Chen and Yan Wu, developed a method to analyze our 16 bisphenols at low enough uh, concentrations. And um, these 16 bisphenols were analyzed as an add-on to our 2017 water cruise. So at each of these sites, we grabbed an extra jar and shipped them off to Da Chen, um, and they analyzed these samples along with Becky's uh, phosphate flame retardants that she'll be presenting to you next. Um, and unfortunately, we saw a difference in our field samples and our field duplicates um, such that we rendered these data unquantitative. So here are our data at a first glance. Each point corresponds to the concentration at each of the sites shown in the map from the previous slide. Um, the mean bars here are the average of just the points shown on screen, so that's omitting percent detect. Um, the concentration is in nanograms per liter. And I do just want to reiterate, we're only talking about BPA and BPS because we didn't see the other bisphenols. We technically did see BPF, but there was some blank contamination, so we censored those data. Um, so again, I'll only be presenting our BPA and BPS data. And you'll notice that um, I have the BPA PNX here at 60 nanograms per liter, and you can see all the BPA levels are basically below that. Um, however, our BPS levels, one above and one pretty close to that threshold. Um, and I do just want to call attention to the dotted line. Um, it's very intentional because we can only really use this BPA PNEC as a frame of reference for BPS. We don't know, as I said, we don't have a PNEC for BPS, don't know whether or not she's higher or lower. Um, and I have total here. Um, what I mean by total is the sum of its dissolved and particulate concentrations, dissolved being the compounds floating around in the water, particulate um, being the compounds that are attached onto um, that suspended sediment that marine talked about earlier. Um, so for BPA, we see it mostly um, in the particulate phase. And we know that it has an affinity for both the dissolved and the particulate phase. So this is to be somewhat expected, but it's, pretty, um, it's a pretty low level for dissolved. And we're thinking it's, it's somewhat readily degradable in the environment. And it's more readily degradable in its dissolved phase. So we see it mostly in the particulate phase. Uh, BPS, on the other hand, we see almost exclusively in the dissolved phase. Uh, we know it has more an, of an affinity for the dissolved phase, but we also know that it's much more persistent. It's much harder to degrade than BPA in the environment, which is um, uh, makes sense as to why we see it at such higher uh, fractions in the dissolved phase and also could make it potentially more harm. Now here we see a map of concentrations. The size of the bubble corresponds to the magnitude of the concentration for total BPA only. Um, we saw in 91% of our, our sites, only two non-detects, we saw it here at our control site. And we see somewhat uniform ubiquity throughout the bay. It's at somewhat uniform levels. Um, however, we can't say the same for BPS. We only saw it at 41% of our sites. We see it mostly in South Bay. We also see it up here in North Bay. And it's hard to ignore this one large concentration here. Um, this could be due to anything. Really, as Jen Lin mentioned, there's such high spatial um, variability with water samples. Um, it could also be due to maybe a boat with an epoxy lining had passed by. There could be a crash in the area. We're really not sure what caused this high uh, concentration. Um, I also want to note that it's interesting that BPA is manufactured and imported at much higher levels than BPS here in the States. But we're seeing the two at similar levels. And again, that could be due to BPS 
um, being much more persistent in the environment. And um, I mentioned earlier in my beginning slides that these bisphenols have been monitored globally, and BPA and BPS are usually the two bisphenols um, that show up at the highest level, so our story fits there. Um, but when we're talking about relative levels, this is um, a bar chart that compares our level here, our highest uh, peak level of total BPA was 35 nanograms per liter. This is a log scale over here on the left, and I'm comparing to mostly other um, bodies of water here in California. Um, we have, or on the west coast, rather. And so we have the other estuary that I could find up in Puget Sound was a little bit higher, but you can see it's comparable to kind of average North American marine waters. Um, the next three sources are all pathways. We would expect them to show higher levels of BPA. And our last bar here, um, our only international data point I included because I want to talk more about this study. Um, Tiang Wang in 2017 collected um, and analyzed these nine bisphenol samples in water and in um, tissue samples from 17 different organisms in Taihu Lake in China. Um, we have water samples up here, we have tissue down here. You can see they saw BPA, BPAF, and uh, BPS in, as the, the largest contributors to concentrations in water. What I want to call your attention to is BPC. Um, we can see that they barely saw it in their water, and they had lower detection um, levels uh, limits than ours. We didn't see BPC in our water. Um, however, when you come down and look at their tissue samples, you can see that BPC contributes about, to about 25% of um, their bisphenol, uh, total sum of bisphenol. Um, so the reason I'm showing this is because even though we saw BPA and BPS and none of the other bisphenols in our water, um, it doesn't mean that it's not in our tissues. It doesn't mean that it's not in our sediment. Um, they have varying chemical properties and varying environmental fate. Um, I also want to note that they did not analyze the six bisphenols that we would um, expect to accumulate in tissues the most. Um, so BPC and another six bisphenols that we didn't see in our, our water samples, we really have no idea whether or not they'd be in our tissues. So to tie us back in to the beginning, um, we know bisphenols are present in the bay. We see BPA and we see BPS, and they're at somewhat comparable levels to protective ecotox thresholds. Our collaborator, Da Chen, did an overall a global review of um, bisphenols and bis uh, BPA and, and bisphenol analogs and um, identified seven data gaps and um, prioritized environmental monitoring as the number one thing that we can do to, um, to, to really elucidate our understanding of our global risk to bisphenols as a class of compounds. So the work that uh, the RMC can do here is very important. Um, the next steps for bisphenols are to write up these data in a draft report and have it ready for emerging contaminant uh, experts to review in advance of our April 11th and 12th work group meeting. Um, we're going to agendize this discussion of these data along with a proposed sphere classification um, and have our experts and our stakeholders come up with our next steps, um, which could include um, classification up to as high as moderate concern, which I'll get to in the next slide, as well as monitoring and other major fees, as I mentioned. We see them in our water. We don't know um, if and where else they are in our bay. So uh, once again, we're back at this tier, and we're thinking of classifying up to as high as um, moderate concern. Um, we, we saw BPA. It was below our ecotox threshold, um, our PNEC, but we saw BPS at some higher levels. Um, and since we don't have toxicity thresholds for BPS, and we don't know their effects um, when they're combined together, and we don't know if they're in our other matrices. We either won't know enough um, to move it out of possible concern, or we will move it up to moderate concern. Um, just some of my references, and I would like to thank supporters of the RMP, um, as well as our collaborators over at University.
Thank you, Isla. And as we transition to Dr. Sutton, I want to note that Dr. Sutton is the linkage, the primary linkage to um, the, our state's uh, green chemistry safer for consumer products program. And uh, DTC folks are among the many emerging contaminant folks that I've been getting texts from that are listening on the web. So Dr. Sutton, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, hearing me OK, everyone? I'm good, good? All right. So final talk of the day. I'm the closer. I <laughs> <laughs> Woo! <laughs> We're almost there. So I'm going to give you an overview of our work on flame retardants that's going to tie in well with management action, some of the stuff we talked about this morning. So some of this is actually going to be review for you guys, but I am going to highlight some brand new data and management actions as well. All right, so flame retardants is a great example of our emerging contaminants focus area where we, where's my, oh no, 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 you got to see the next picture, guys. Here, let me do the, I'm going to do the arrow. No, it's not working. Uh, yeah. huh. See, isn't this great? <laughs> so, uh, scanning the horizon, right? I, I emailed around. We need a, I need a picture of someone at the helm. And here is our intrepid RMP manager scanning the horizon, looking for problematic chemicals. We are trying to spot problems. You know. Keeping us on track here. We're all in the back trying to figure stuff out, but he's keeping us on track so that we can avoid any pollution situation. That too, yes. Big problems, small problems, we're trying to avoid all of them, and flame retardants is a, is a great example of our work here. So flame retardants, these things are chemical additives. They're used in a lot of different products we use every day, so couches, foam furniture, baby products, construction materials, electronics, all these things have chemical flame retardants in them, and they have them there because of flammability standards. Some are industry or voluntary, but we like to talk a lot about this one technical bullets in 117, an older state standard that was set in place in the 70s. And folks thought, hey, we want to protect folks from fire. Let's put some chemicals in products. Well, actually, they just said, let's make our products resist an open flame test. And if they resist this open flame test, maybe that'll let us escape in the event of a house fire. A very well-intentioned standard that set back in the 70s. Turns out it's not actually providing that protection that was hoped for. And it did lead to use of polybrominated diphenyl ethers in our, our furniture, baby products, all kinds of stuff. So fast forward a couple decades, and we start to realize these PBDEs are actually toxic. They're in our bodies. And the RMP and others showed these were also in our wildlife and collecting up in San Francisco Bay. So where do we place them in our tiered risk framework? So Diana walked us through this tool that we use for our emerging contaminants program, which allows us to prioritize our work and also can help managers prioritize. So we've done a ton of monitoring for PBDEs in all kinds of matrices. And we, for many years, classified PBDEs as a moderate concern for our bay. And this is because we did see levels in bay matrices that were above ecotoxicity thresholds. So we felt these really deserve a lot of attention because we're concerned they could be causing low-level impact. I don't know how everyone did this without sipping the water. Now, luckily, our state legislature acted really fast based on RMP data and all the generated science. So you guys know this, right? Back, uh, back in, actually in 2004, our state legislature went ahead and banned two of the three types of PBDEs. They banned this in 2004. The ban wasn't going to take effect till 2006, but the whole industry just said, forget it. We're getting out of making these here in the U.S. If California won't buy them, we don't want to make them. It took a little longer for the science to develop on DECA, the last one, but that did get phased out a few years ago. So we've been monitoring since this time, since even before this time, and what we found, this is probably a story you guys are familiar with, is a great recovery story, a great success story for our Bay, where thanks to these management actions that were informed by our science, we have seen declines all across Bay matrices. This is just our fish data. But we've seen uh, declines in sediment and other wildlife tissues. It's a really good story for how management actions can lead to our bay getting cleaner and safer. 
but we still got a flame retardant problem, right? Because manufacturers weren't using those things just because they felt like it. They were using PBDEs to meet a flammability standard. Standard's still in place, so they got to switch to other chemicals. The RMP's prepared. We know this switch is going to happen, so we need to figure out, are there any alternatives that we can spot in San Francisco Bay? So that's uh, what we did back in 2014. This was my first big study for you guys. We went ahead and did a screening looking at four different matrices, water, sediment, bivalves, and harbor seal blubber. And we looked for PBDEs and three different types of alternatives, a total of 52 alternatives. So the bromine and chlorine types, they act a lot like PBDEs. So uh, same kind of uh, movement in the bay, same kind of uh, fate. The phosphates are different, though. These are really water-soluble and mobile. They're kind of like the bisphenols that Isla was talking about. And I'm also happy to announce that just earlier this week, we got a paper accepted on this study in a journal called Science and Civil Environment. It was a long time coming. But, you know, perseverance, right? Okay, so long story short, we found contaminants in all of these matrices. But what really caught our eye was the phosphates in the water. So you don't need to remember uh, the alphabet soup up here or the specific numbers. These are the five top phosphates. There were a number of others we looked at. And these are uh, ranges in nanograms per liter of what we saw in the bay. And what you basically need to take in is that these levels are actually pretty high compared to other studies in other parts of the globe. It really caught our eye you know, doing, doing this uh, review compared to other And even more important for our risk-based uh, approach is the fact that for a couple of these, PDCP, otherwise known as chlorinated trips, and TPHP, or triphenyl phosphate, these two were actually found at levels higher than these PNET, fairly protected marine ecotoxic thresholds that we use to stop uh, our assessment. So, okay, we see this. We've only got, you know, maybe 12 water samples. So our first thought is, are these anomalous data? We need to go back and take another look. So that's what we did. You know, Isla's bisphenol studies, we did the same thing. Uh, 2017, we tacked on to our status and trends monitoring additional sampling for these phosphates, um, more comprehensive this time. And so these are the brand new data. Oh, what you're seeing, I should have I should have called your attention to it, but these are lower numbers. So this is kind of this is kind of good news. So those earlier numbers we saw, we're seeing lower numbers now. So maybe we're not off the chart contaminated. We're much more comparable to what we see in other parts of the world at this point. When it comes to those thresholds, we are still seeing levels higher for that, that TDCPP, that chlorinated trip. But triphenyl phosphate, maybe not so much. Maybe that's not as big a concern. All right, I'm going to focus a little bit on TDCPP, just give you one more slide on that one. OK, so this is comparing both our studies, 2017, and we grabbed the water in 2013 for the 2014 study, and a couple of other studies of urbanized bays or bites. So the good news here, as I mentioned, is that our general ranges for 2017 PDCPP are now very consistent with other parts of the world, other urbanized settings. So this is reassuring. We're not. We're not a hot spot. You know, we're, we're kind of like the rest of the world. What caused the super high levels in 2013? Why did we have such high levels? What was that? Yep. So along with all the other things we need to worry about with drought, we also need to think about higher levels of phosphates. And this, this came up with selenium, right? So there's, there's other um, contaminants where this is also something we need to be concerned about. And here I'm laying over the, uh, the aquatic toxicity threshold that we're using, the marine ecotox threshold out of the European Union, where we can see, again, for this individual compound, that we are reporting some levels in our bay that are higher. I do want to emphasize a strong part of our program is to consider chemicals 
similar chemicals with similar uses and similar structures that act similarly in the environment as classes or kind of a comprehensive suites of compounds. And this gets to some of what I was talking about in terms of endocrine disruption. So it turns out these phosphate flame retardants also have endocrine disrupting activity, uh, estrogenicity as well as fibroid activity. And you can imagine when you got something like this, okay, it's more chemical structures, but, uh, you know, these very similar chemical structures could interact with receptors in very similar ways, right? So we know they're all out in the bay. Our wildlife are co-exposed. We know they cause endocrine disrupting effects. Cumulative impacts are possible. And our ecotox thresholds, which are set for individual compounds sort of in, in exclusion of anything else, can't really capture this sort of cumulative concern. But it's something we think about a lot within the RMP because, you know, we're really rooted in the, our own setting, the practical environment of co-exposure. We want to be protective of our bed. So considering phosphate flame retardants as a class, what do we think about the risk? Right? Here's our, here's our tiered risk framework again. Until now, we've been calling all alternative flame returns, including the phosphates, as a possible concern. We didn't have a ton of data, right? But as Isla mentioned, for bisphenols, in the April meeting for Emerging Contaminants Workgroup, we're going to need to walk through a rationale, and we're going to need to figure out with our experts and stakeholders whether there's sufficient justification to move the phosphate flame retardants to that moderate concern category. So I imagine there's going to be a lot of engagement. It's a, this is an important decision for us to make uh, and informed by all our top experts and uh, our stakeholders to figure out this, this very important issue. All right, meanwhile, we're trying to figure out how these compounds get to the bay. They're in our consumer products. What's the pathway? And we are super lucky with the Emerging Contaminants Work Group to have some of the top experts specifically on flame retardants. So these two folks do a ton of the research on flame retardants. They're real leaders in the field. And they have done the actual product testing. So they're the ones that can tell us what's in our products because the companies won't tell you. And they've also done the studies to trace these chemicals from products into the dust in our homes and offices, uh, stuck to our clothing. And then, you know, we get that, dump it down the drain, and it goes to the wastewater treatment plant. So this is a pathway these two have really sussed out. And it turns out, back in our 2014 study, we grabbed a, just a couple of effluent samples, and we did see phosphate flame retardants in our wastewater. So this pathway is a pretty well-supported one. How about our other big pathway, stormwater? Well, Dr. Diamond here has done a recent modeling effort for her area of Toronto, where she uh, has, has calculated, and our grad students, that uh, the, these uh, compounds in our personal, or our personal, our consumer products can off-gas or volatilize and basically get into the air in our urban environment, upon which time they can be rained out into our streams and our stormwater. Now, this is more preliminary, her modeling effort. Back in 2014, we did grab a couple stormwater samples, and we did find phosphate flame retardants in them. So there's some data here. But our levels were kind of uh, very different, very all over the place, because you guys know that stormwater is really variable. So depending on when you grab, grab a grab during a storm, um, which site you choose, you can get levels that are kind of all over the map. So this is uh, something we might want to examine further. And this is actually uh, what Diana discovered as she reviewed our phosphate flame return data for a recently finalized report just a couple months ago. This was ahead of our 2017 findings. And she reviewed the, all of our data, all the state of the science, and she determined that one of the major data gaps we had was when it comes to stormwater. So this is something that really merits a further examination. Now, if any of you were here last year at the annual meeting, you might remember our colleague Jennifer Sun presenting some unusual non-target analysis findings this is a novel technique, right, that we've heard about. Uh, Phil mentioned it and Kevin and talking about uh, in relation to the fire impacts in the, in the NAP and the North Bay. 
We also deployed non-target at a stormwater influence site of San Leandro Bay. And we found some unusual contaminants associated with tires and vehicles that really caught our eye in terms of having potential aquatic toxicity. And so based on this non-target analysis that Jennifer presented and Diana's work on the phosphate flame retardants, we have now decided to launch, the RMP is launching, a 2019 CEC screening of stormwater. So as soon as it starts raining, we're going to be out there collecting samples and we're going to get more info on the flame retardants, on these tire-related contaminants, diphenylguanidine, like Phil mentioned this morning. And we are imagining that this is a pilot scale effort this first year and that we'll do more monitoring in the second and third year to really get a sense of what kinds of emerging contaminants are in stormwater. It's an area where stormwater, this pathway has not been very much explored when it comes to emerging type contaminants. All right, so this is a great way we can generate data, but we really, our goal here with the Emerging Contaminants Program in particular is to feed our information to inform management action. Because after all, if we want to reduce pollution from these type of phosphate flame retardants, we need to address why they're being used in the first place. Now, for example, these standards, and in particular with some of these standards, like the furniture standard I mentioned, they don't even work as we had hoped. They're not providing fire safety for us people. So you guys probably know some of this, but our California Bureau of Home Furnishings is, has changed the rules. They examined their fire safety standard, their flammability standard. They realized they needed to refocus it on smoldering cigarettes. They wrote a new standard, CB117-2013. And this standard is more protective. It really addresses the right type of source of a fire. And you don't have to use chemicals to meet it most of the time. So it's really reducing the incentive for manufacturers of furniture to actually put these chemicals in there in the first place. Then shortly thereafter, our legislature passed the labeling law. So now if you're out there shopping for furniture, the tag will tell you whether or not there's flame retardants. Or you could just go ahead and ban all these chemicals. So that's what San Francisco did last year. Passed an ordinance for furniture and baby products saying, hey, can't sell them around here if they've got these flame returns in them. And some of you may have been tracking this, of course I was, but uh, just a couple weeks ago, Governor Brown went ahead and assigned a similar bill for the whole state. Uh, I think this one actually also includes mattress foam. So again, we're, we're just going to go ahead and ban toxic flame retardants from a lot of our consumer products, a great source control means of preventing pollution for our bay. The story's not over, though. Of course. Um, there's other types of products besides furniture and baby products, the ones I've talked about a lot, like, for example, electronics or building and construction materials. And a lot of these are governed by other types of flammability standards. Some folks are starting to examine these standards to make sure they're actually providing fire protection. Because a lot of times those standards were set a long time ago before we really understand as much as we do now about how fire works. Then we got another interesting wrinkle with phosphate flame retardants. Uh, some of these same chemicals are used for other purposes besides flame retardancy. So this calls back to Isla's talk. There's actually a, uh, a phosphate-based substitute for this polycarbonate plastic in your, your hard plastic reusable water bottle. It's a triphenol phosphate one. So one of the substitutes isn't even bisphenol. It's one of our phosphate friends here. So we, we still got to do, uh, you know, keep our eye on this one for a while longer, right? But in general, I hope this is a good example, a good story of how we are generating the science that's needed to inform policy. We want to, you know, trans transform that monitoring data into the information that policymakers and water quality managers need, need in order to protect our bay. <laughs> Thank you, uh, and I, I know that those are applause not only for Dr. Sutton, but for our other speakers. I'd please like to ask our other speakers to come down, and at this point, if you all have questions, we have just a few minutes for those, but I'm sure that if you wanted to walk across the street, you could keep the conversation going over there after the meeting. So uh, questions?
Yeah, I had a question on the pharmaceutical. Is there any data that separates the pharmaceutical that flushes through our body versus the one that are dumped directly? And uh, the second question, at this point, now that we know these pills going to be with us for and only going to increase, what are uh, some of the um, steps being taken for treatment? I even heard even there's like uh, things for um, like um, filters in the toilets. Where is all that the development standing at this point? Um, okay, let's see. The first question was uh, excretion versus so that's a really good question. It's almost impossible to quantify because you have to be monitoring and actually like spike in disposal. Um, there have been studies where they happen to be monitoring a um, a watershed and they noticed a spike and were able to trace it to disposal. Um, but it's hard. It's almost it's hard to quantify on a large scale. And then you almost have to go um, upstream and ask people like behavior questions. How often do you dispose of drugs? And there are surveys, but that's a lot more qualitative rather than quantitative. Um, and then in terms of wastewater treatment, I, I don't think we're going there, but I don't know if anyone else knows more about treatment of pharmaceuticals. Other questions? Yeah, I, yeah. Okay. yeah although yeah. partly answering that, the, my, a rule of thumb that we've been working with, though, is 75-25 uh, regarding pharmaceuticals, 20, maybe 25% associated with illegal disposal, but the dominant source is just humans. We know that the way they're prescribed, used, clearly a strong signal there. So that we can't solve the problem just by managing bad disposal. We know that. In wastewater treatment options, huge expense. Huge, huge expense. But that's something America, we're going to have to come to terms with. But I got a comment and then a question. Comment I just want to explain from a management perspective. Putting something in the moderate tier is a good, not necessarily a bad thing, could be a good thing. What we want to do is keep things out of the high tier, high concern tier. So by putting it at possible, that means that we are going to generate an action plan of some sort to try to inform an appropriate management response, and we're going to enhance, give us cause to enhance our study of the study. So it's not, that's not a red flag, it's a yellow, orange flag. And so it's okay, and we've been willing to put things in there with the weight of evidence that there's a risk that we want to start managing, particularly get the attention of parties, whether it be the legislature or there would be the Department of Toxic Substance Control through the state consumer product process or Department of Pesticide Regulation. So it's a good thing as long as we do it wisely. We don't want to lose credibility by that. The other, but another observation is it's a lot likely was going to happen as we get more information and way evidence, we're going to have more and more and more in that tier. And we're going to we're going to run into the unfortunate dilemma of many things have to end with. Right now we have a, a vast majority of our compounds are in the unknown possible area. It's inevitable that more many are going to get triaged into moderate, some into low, hopefully as well. So that's so I don't a good thing. But the question I have is just mostly puzzling. I don't really see the nexus with drought in the in the water soluble phosphate, you know, like especially in the South Bay, what would what would drought have to do? Plenium drought I, I don't see quite logic other than it was Well, I think we'd want to go to influence to verify that hypothesis. But basically I mean we all really cut back like what, 20, 30 percent in terms of our water use, right? But it doesn't mean we weren't washing. Yeah, less dilution from, yeah. Any other questions? I've got just a brief one. Oh, do we have one up here? Go ahead. This isn't a question. This is, this is a comment, and, and just just a kudos. I mean, I'm of the generation that remembers the deep spray and the deep sea and running around behind. And we've spent a generation cleaning up bees. And I can remember the first time I heard Mike Connor say, "I want to prevent the next chemical." And you guys were 
just sensational, sensational presentation. Shut up. Thank you. <laughs> and on that note, uh, we're at 3.58, and we have to vacate the room at 4, and I do want to give Phil the last word. So thank you all. Oh, yes. <clears throat> so um, we are trying to end meeting on time. This is one of the things I, I try to do, and we're going to make it. Uh, so I want, anyway, I want to thank you all for your attention today. Three more things I'm going to ask of you in a very short time. First is to thank all of our speakers. It was a great session all day. All right. uh, number two, uh, look for an email from me from us tomorrow with an evaluation form. Uh, we really appreciate your feedback on uh, how the meeting was run, individual speakers, types of speech, types of talk. We covered. Take the time to fill that out. And up here, right. Cross Street at Jupiter for a social event. We have every year. We get a chance to, to get to interact as people. We can talk more science. We can talk about anything else. Uh, all you have to do is walk across the street, go down a half a block, and there's a little gate there that says Jupiter. And you walk in there, and we're going to converge there and have the initial part of the social there, and then we'll move inside uh, at five o'clock. So I want to thank you all for a great day and for. Um, all that you've done for the RMP, and I look forward to future success. Thank you. Yeah, we don't actually do. <laughs>